Oh, that was wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, I, I kind of had a panic attack when I, I you know, because I thought it's uh, a Monday night and we've had a terrible weekend and it's sunny, and I thought nobody's going to come. <laughs> So um, I, thank you all for being here. I, I just want to begin with some personal comments about this film and the book. And I have my own. I have the advanced copy of the book, so it doesn't have the cover that you see on the one that you buy on, on Amazon. But I got to meet uh, Margot Lee Shetterly over a year ago um, while she was still working on the book. Um, so. I, I have to, I think it's probably two years ago, when she was still working on the book, and she was um, instructed to, to get in touch with me to check some facts and data about African American women um, scientists in the US. So this is a compelling, a powerful film uh, about a topic that very few people um, outside of my own little feel of the history of science actually know anything about. And so the personal part of this is, so I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and I was very much uh, a science nerd kid. Uh, so my father bought me my first Gilbert chemistry set when I was six. See, you guys, the people here who know what that is, right? <laughs> okay, so. After Christmas dinner, I set it up on my mother's mahogany dining room table. <laughs> and guess what? The acid spill stained on her table. I was banished to the furthest corner of the basement. <laughs> my dad thought, she's going to be good at this. And my mother was like, no. <laughs> And so uh, early on, my parents were very supportive of my interest in studying um, science and supported my curiosity about it in every possible way that they could. Uh, but it was many years before I understood that to be an, a young African-American woman who wanted to study science was something that most people thought was the weirdest thing they'd ever heard. And so um, by the time I was in college, I was, I would, I figured on most days, the best way to deal with what I was interested in was to simply say, um, you know, um, I just kind of like the way the world works and I want to understand how the world works. And my Spelman, my Spelman colleagues, I went to Spelman College, which, which is the premier Afri college for African American women in the United States, who has produced, Spelman College in Atlanta has produced more African American women with PhDs than any other college in this country. And I would say one of the reasons they did that is because the generation of teachers, my teachers, are the generation of the women you will see in this film. So it wasn't a surprise to me to have two teachers who were mathematicians in the math department. That wasn't a surprise. Because my, my ninth grade teacher who had graduated from Spelman, who was my algebra teacher, was from Spelman. My 11th grade teacher who taught me pre-calculus was from Spelman. I didn't know, it didn't seem strange to me to have an African-American woman as a math teacher. And most of them were demanding, hugely demanding, had high expectations of us that they made clear every day. And I'll never forget when Dr. Shirley McBay, one of the first African-American women to get a PhD in mathematics, called me in when I made a, a B plus on an exam and she said, what is this? <laughs> I said, well, you know, I really didn't understand, you know, this part. And she said, did you come and talk to me about it? No. Okay. Well, this is why you got a B plus. Let's not have this happen again, okay? <laughs> you can do better than this. I expect better than this. And I expect you to master this work. This is a woman who stayed in my life for the rest of my career in the sciences. So this is a kind of mentoring. When people talk about mentoring, I don't think they understand what it was like to have Shirley McBay be one of your mentors. Because it was the kind of, she was the kind of person who said, an A minus? Really? I don't understand that. 
So this is the kind of mentoring that happened at Spelman. From, my, from the time I was in uh, eighth grade through the time of my college years, I had these kind of women. And I had no idea how unique they were. For the most part, any African American woman of that generation, and that's a coming of age in the early 1950s when they would have held those positions, the only jobs they could usually get would be to teach in public schools or in some of the historically black colleges and universities. Few of them were, had any opportunity to work in an institution like Langley, like you're going to see in the film. OK, so and because of the way they were, they didn't make much of the fact that they were our math teachers and they studied math. They made it a normal part of our lives. So when I was applying to MIT um, as a senior from Spelman and at that point at Georgia Tech as well, I just thought, well, I want to study physics and MIT is really cool and I want to go there and so I'll apply there. I had no idea that people thought I was out of my mind. <laughs> the person who thought that the most was my father who went to my mother and said, I don't understand. I think, I think she's really lost it. <laughs> black people don't go to MIT, and black women definitely don't go to MIT. So I don't want her to be hurt, but we got to stop her. It's not going to happen. It happened. I went to MIT. <laughs> He was very proud and very pleased. So, but I went to MIT because one of the first African American women to get a PhD in physics from, MI, from in this country went to MIT and she directly recruited me to come to MIT. So I wasn't gonna go somewhere who had never seen a black woman before. That wouldn't have been good. So I went to MIT where I could uh, um, be in a place um, that was exciting, the most exciting place I'd ever seen in my life. But also that Shirley Jackson, who's now president of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, um, had gone to study. So um, I'm just trying to give you some background, actually from a personal view of the kind of world that is going to be depicted in this film. But it's a world that I am the second generation of, not the generation of the women shown in the film. But they were, that generation were my teachers. And so these are the women who were our mentors, who helped us, who supported us, who encouraged us, who thought we could change the world and believed in us. So the other part I want, point I want to make as we go on is that the fact that we have um, a movie now, the first time in history a mainstream Hollywood movie about black women mathematicians and science. I'm like, when I heard about it, I was this can't be true. This can't be, because our heroes for my generation, our hero was Lieutenant Uhuru on Star Trek. Classic Trek. <laughs> And why was Lieutenant Uhuru our, our hero? She wasn't a domestic in, on Star Trek. She was the communications officer. She could talk to the Klingons. It's very important and necessary in many moments. And so, uh, you know, so um, Michelle Nichols, who played that part, at some point she felt she was being kind of stereotyped and didn't want to do it. Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged her to continue in that role because of the importance, the important role that she played as a role model for African-American kids who were watching um, the show who thought we were going to have a, a place in the future in outer space. So we had Lieutenant Uhuru in popular culture, but we had nobody else. So when this film came out, and when I first met Margot, um, I hear the story and the way she told the story of the women uh, that appear in Hidden Figures. It was like, finally, this film has opened the door to a world that so many of us, I include myself in this and all of you, never heard of that there were African-American women who were doing mathematics and engineering at the highest level at that point in our history. And that history had been written out of history. It had been written out of history for reasons I don't want to diss my colleagues in the history of science, but it was partly their fault. <laughs> 
So um, despite the, so what you're gonna see is a, is a film that has some, lots of complexities in it, but despite the challenges that these women faced, they persevered and they triumphed. And I think it's, some people have questioned whether it should be such a seamless story of triumph, but I think you will see many of the barriers they faced, but I think you'll also see and I think it's important for you to see the barriers because those barriers continue. And the last part I want to show you is just some of the data that will indicate to you uh, what I'm trying to talk about. Here's data on mathematicians. And you can see that data on new doctoral recipients in mathematics in 1999 to 2000, there are a total of seven African Americans. Okay? If we move ahead a decade, there's a total of 21 out of a total of 635 white men. Okay? We are talking tiny, tiny numbers who get through to the ranks of having a PhD who are African American men and women. So I turned to physics because my undergraduate degree is in, uh, I have degrees in physics and electrical engineering and computer science, a master's degree in physics from MIT. And so uh, I have to turn to the field I know best, and uh, that's physics, and you can see, I think many of you in the audience can see, that at no point have underrepresented minorities. That's African Americans, Latinos, some groups of uh, Asian Americans, certainly Asian and Pacific Islanders. You know, we've never had more since 1995 than about 8% of the population uh, in this field. Uh, from, you can also see on this chart, the same kind of thing. The number of physics doctorates earned by African Americans and Hispanic Americans, 1997 through 2012. And the film takes you further back. So realize that I, I asked you to think about historical change. How much is, how really, how much has changed, okay? And you can see those numbers. Um, and then minority faculty members, we know that uh, African Americans, for example, are about 13% of the US population. Hispanics are about 17%. And then you look at the representation in the physics faculty. So in the entire United States, of the thousands and thousands of college physics and astronomy faculty, only 75 are African American or Hispanic women. And according to a new survey, female minorities make up less than 1% of the 9,050 physics faculty members in this country. Most physics students never see a black faculty member. Okay, So they don't have any empirical evidence that individuals from these groups actually do physics. As people have begun to do more and more studies, uh, part of the thing that has happened is there have been so few, it's been very hard to do uh, sophisticated statistical analyses because the cell sizes are so small, but people have done qualitative research. This is an article from the Washington Post, Black and Latina Women Scientists Sometimes Mistaken for Janitors. This is a very impressive study done out of the Hastings Center Law School at Berkeley. The one finding that they had they had never seen before and all the interviews they had done with white women scientists, Hispanic women scientists, here are black and Latina women scientists say they are often, and well, sometimes, and I would say often, mistaken for janitors. And think about that point as you watch the film. Uh, more and more do we have uh, analyses about gender inequality in science. This is uh, just a, a, a page from a, um, recent article in Science. Uh, you know Angela Merkel is a, is a scientist. Um, and so the end of this story is this. A consequence of relegating race, gender, and ethnicity to the margins of our understanding of scientific community is that we fail to fully describe and articulate the structures of social relations within scientific communities. These communities are here in the United States among us. They're not somewhere off on another planet. 
And to end, my point is that by not attending to the specific experience of African-American women, African-American, other women of color in science and engineering, that we really, really, um, we have, what we have done is make these people uh, invisible, right? We have relegated the experiences of these women to a location that we can't even talk about. And that's why this first mainstream, major Hollywood movie that addresses those questions is so important. And in the process, we have hindered efforts in science and engineering, mathematics, um, that would allow us as a nation to make the best use of the talent of all our citizens who can and desire to do this work. You are going to enjoy this film, I guarantee you. It's marvelous and wonderful and powerful, but I hope in the background you think about some of this information I presented to you this evening. So thank you for having me and enjoy the film. <laughs> <laughs>